Middle Eastern Studies professor Fawaz Jerziz chronicles the evolution of militant Islam in his new book, Journey of the Jihadist. He spoke about it recently at Politics and Prose Bookstore in Washington, D.C., for an hour, ten minutes. Tonight, we're pleased to welcome Fawaz Jerziz to speak on his new book, Journey of the Jihadist. Following on the tale of his last book, The Far Enemy, Why Jihad Went Global, Mr. Jerzis' new book expands on that prior topic through detailed profiles of self-identified jihadists. He describes the surprisingly heterogeneous world in which jihadists have a wide spectrum of opinions rather than the monolithic set of beliefs often ascribed to them. Drawing upon interviews that date back to 1999, Mr. Jerzis describes three generations of jihadists, the moderate and the ultra-militant, the pragmatist and the irrational. He stresses that jihadists are at heart political rather than religious, and many jihadists repudiate terrorism. That is not to say, however, that jihadists reject violence. They don't. But the journey of jihadists illustrates that the concept we have developed with those dedicated to jihad deserves re-examination. The truth is often far more complex than we have imagined. Mr. Jerzis is a senior analyst at ABC News as well as an NPR commentator. Both a MacArthur and a Fulbright recipient, he has taught at Harvard, Princeton, and Oxford, and he now holds the Christian A. Johnson Chair in Middle Eastern and International Affairs at Sarah Lawrence College. Please help me welcome Fawaz Jerzis. Uh, thank you uh, for coming uh, tonight. I know you're very busy, um, and I, I appreciate the fact uh, that you've taken the time and the energy to come here. And I hope uh, that uh, what I say tonight will not be taken for granted, and I'm sure it, it won't. So uh, at the end of my talk, I would be delighted to answer any questions you have, to try to answer any questions you have, because I think, as you know, this subject is highly complex and I think uh, is pregnant with controversies and various interpretations. Let me say a few words about the book itself. This is not an I good book. Uh, I don't make arguments in the book, in the journey of the jihadist. Uh, I made my arguments in the uh, far enemy, why jihad went global, uh, which was published by Cambridge University Press. This is a book about voices. Uh, what do I mean, a book about uh, voices? Uh, I let uh, jihadists or militants tell their story in their own words. Um, I let them express uh, their grievances, their biases, their prejudices. Uh, I think in a simple uh, way, uh, this particular book is a humble effort at understanding this particular shadowy universe, the jihadist universe that shattered America's peace of mind on 9-11, in fact long before 9-11 since the late 1990s. Uh, why do we have to hear the voices? Uh, if we believe that all jihadists are evildoers, as the dominant narrative in the United States seems to suggest after 9-11, there is no reason to read the book. If you really believe that uh, all of them, if we can lump all militants and jihadists in one particular camp, there is no reason to read this particular book. Uh, however, however, regardless of what we think of jihadists, uh, and by the way, uh, jihadists have very little positive to say about America or American foreign policy. That's not the question. We are not talking about whether they like us or not. That's not, that's not the question. But I think what I really wanted to understand, what I wanted, uh, I mean, the audience in the United States and the West to understand, is that who are uh, those jihadists, basically, who uh, decided to target the far enemy, the far enemy being the United States? What is their social background? Uh, where do they come from? What fuels their anger and rage against America and Americans and American foreign policy? Uh, what do they think? Are they all alike? All militants? All jihadists? Are they all determined, as some of us believe, to wage holy war against the West and America? Uh, are they a monolith? Or are there some differences, major differences and nuances and complexities uh, among uh, jihadists? Are all jihadists determined to wage a holy war against America and Americans? Those are very important questions. Um, and I think <clears throat> what I wanted to do is to really see whether there are some major differences, nuances, among this particular uh, universe. And I, what I've done 
And just a footnote of, about what I've done in this particular book, I began researching this book in 1999. I had a MacArthur Fellowship, and I spent two years in the Middle East, in Egypt and the various countries, uh, trying to, I mean, uh, uh, just uh, you think that uh, jihadism, jihadists, uh, were basically born in Egyptian and Arab universities. Jihadism is a social movement. Uh, jihadism uh, was not born in the ghettos of Arab and Muslim cities. And even in the, in the mid-1990s, I began, began interested in this particular phenomenon. It's a social movement. I am a student of social movements, whether it's radical Arab nationalism or radical uh, Islamism. Uh, and this is why I began interested long before jihadism became a familiar household in the United States itself. I returned from the Middle East in 2000, and of course we know what happened on September 11. I could not write the book um, in 2001 or 2002. I don't think I could have written this book in 2002 because, I mean, the country was injured. I don't think Americans were willing to listen to the voices that uh, um, I wanted uh, to really uh, uh, at least uh, give uh, an outlet to in this particular uh, voice. And what I have done in this particular book is I have followed the journey of three generations of jihadists. Um, and I tried to chart this particular journey since the mid-1970s. The jihadist movement was born in the mid-1970s in Egyptian universities. And in this particular sense, there are three generations for the, I mean, just to restructure analysis and give some conceptual uh, clarity to the subject. The first generation is what I call the pioneers or the founding fathers of the jihadist movement, which was born in Egyptian universities in the mid-1970s. Uh, and this pioneers or founding fathers generations uh, basically uh, pioneered the entire jihadist movement. And as you know, they killed uh, Anwar Sadat in 1981. And between 1981 and 1997, the first pioneering generations or founding fathers initiated or carried out one of the major brutal assaults against uh, the near enemy. The near enemy meaning Arab and Muslim governments in Egypt, in Algeria, and other places. Uh, let's put it this way. The first generation, the pioneers, the founding fathers of the jihadist movement, were strategically defeated on the battlefield in almost every single Arab and Muslim countries by the mid-1990s. And what I do uh, on, on, in, on this, uh, when I, I follow this particular journey, I focus on one of the founding fathers of this particular generation. His name is Kamal Habib. I spent about one year, one year and a half in, 19, in the late 1990s. I basically I was in Egypt, and I, I wanted to understand, I mean, Kamal Habib, the central character of the first generation, uh, graduated top in his class in political science and law in Egyptian universities. He was one of the most charismatic students in, uh, at Cairo University. He was destined to be, I mean, one of the leaders, leading leaders of, of Egypt. Uh, he and his cohorts, of course, I did not just focus on him, I focused on his class, on his group. He comes from, he came from a middle upper class family. I mean, I kept <coughs> asking, you know, I'm a social scientist. I expected him to tell me, well, look, I basically migrated uh, to Milesi because of my socioeconomic background. I had no opportunities. I was born into a poor family. I basically feel angry and outraged at socioeconomic economic conditions. And what Kamal kept telling me, and he and his cohorts, listen, don't impose your socioeconomic analysis on us. We did not uh, join the underground movement because we wanted jobs. We did not do it. We did not really try to commit martyrdom because of economic incentives. We wanted to create Allah's kingdom on earth. We were driven by moral concerns, not socioeconomic concerns. I expected him to tell me it was the Palestinian-Israeli conflict that really drove him, he and his cohorts, into militancy. He said, yes, of course we were angry at Anwar Sadat for signing the, the, the so-called disgraced peace uh, treaty with Israel. He said that's not the real issue. The real issue was moralism. moralism. The secular decadent order in Egypt and, and, and uh, Arab societies. We wanted to topple the secular pro-Western uh, regimes and establish moral, authentic Islamic entities. It was fascinating to me <coughs> because really this particular paradigm went against everything I, I subscribed to as an analyst. You know, we taught as, as graduate students at the, you know, I went to Oxford, that was really everything is driven by socioeconomic 
uh, explanations, moralism and doctrinal issues play a secondary role, not to Kamal. To Kamal, doctrinal and moral issues were the independent factors, not foreign policy. It was really fascinating. But let me, I mean, please remember I'm simplifying a great deal here, and I hope uh, you have questions and we, we, we can elaborate in the question and answer uh, uh, segment. Let it put, put it this way. By the 19, by the mid-1990s, this particular generation, the pioneers or the founding fathers, was strategically defeated on the battlefield. They could not basically topple the existing pro-Western secular governments, either in Egypt or Algeria or Saudi Arabia. And they faced a major dilemma. What to do? The jihadist uh, ship was sinking. Basically, it sank by, by the end of the 1990s. Are we to declare a unilateral ceasefire? Are we to surrender or are we to shift uh, jihad from the near enemy into the far enemy? The near enemy meaning, meaning Arab and Muslim governments and the far enemy meaning the United States and its pro-Western allies. The overwhelming number, the overwhelming number of jihadists declared a unilateral ceasefire by the end of the 1990s. They said enough was enough. We want to take a break. We want to examine our options. However, a small minority within this particular generation, particularly Ayman Zawahiri, Ayman Zawahiri uh, is Al-Qaeda's uh, number two, and Ayman Zawahiri was part of Kamal's generation. In fact, Kamal was sentenced to life uh, uh, in prison. He spent 11 years. He was tortured brutally. He has been uh, arrested, re-arrested several times uh, since 1981, while Kamal and the bulk of his generation, the pioneers, the, f the founding fathers, declared a unilateral ceasefire by the end of the 1990s, a small minority said, well, listen, no way. We're not going to declare a unilateral ceasefire. <coughs> we want to expand jihad. We want to change the target and basically make jihad global, globalize jihad against the far enemy. It's, it was really fascinating to me being in the Middle East in the late 1990s to basically see the internal struggle that basically was unfolding between jihadists like Kamal who wanted to maintain the struggle against the near enemy, their own governments, and international jihadists like Ayman Zawahiri and Osama bin Laden who wanted to take jihad global against the United States and uh, its Western allies. Ayman Zawahiri sent some memos to some of his lieutenants, like Kamal and others, saying, listen, our ship is sinking. The only way for us to survive and rescue the ship is to basically attack the far enemy. The, he called it the head of the snake, the United States of America. He said, because once we attack the United States of America, the United States would lash out angrily against the Ummah, the Muslim community worldwide. And when the United States does lash out angrily against the Ummah, we would gain credibility in the eyes of the Ummah. We would become the vanguard of the nation. It was really fascinating to read the memos, the internal memos, that were not really meant for public consumption. They were meant, he, Ayman Zawahiri, who is really the, the nerve center, the brains behind Al-Qaeda, was trying to convince his, his lieutenants, who basically declared a unilateral ceasefire in Egypt, in Algeria, in Yemen, that the only way for jihadists to survive was to basically expand jihad against the far enemy. And this comes the second generation that is what I call the Al-Qaeda generation or the so-called the Afghan Arab generations. I did the same thing. And please remember, I'm simplifying a great deal here. I followed the journey of the second generation of jihadists. This is the Al-Qaeda generation, the Afghan uh, Arab generation, the generation that went into Afghanistan in the 1980s and fought the so-called the evil empire. Remember, the Russians invaded Afghanistan in 1980, and a major war erupted in Afghanistan between 1980 and 1989. And ironically, what's ironic about the second generation, we, the United States of America, were in the same trenches as was the, the second generation. We were in the same camp fighting the evil empire in Afghanistan. I mean, I know this particular point has not really been debated a great deal. I mean, Osama bin Laden was the middleman between Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, and the United States, and the so-called Afghan Arabs or the Afghan Mujahideen in Afghanistan. Up to 1991, Osama bin Laden was one of the voices opposed to expanding jihad either against the near enemy or the far enemy. 
up to 1991. I mean, this is empirical fact. I'm not saying anything uh, original here. And the question is, the question is, um, as I try to answer, why this generation, the second generation, that was in the same tranches uh, with the United States throughout the 1980s, basically turned its guns against the United States of America, against Saudi Arabia, which, as you know, between 1980 and 1989, the United States and Saudi Arabia basically provided about eight or nine, if not more, uh, billion dollars for the war in Afghanistan. And the Afghan Arab Mujahideen, the Afghan Arabs, the Al-Qaeda generation was one of the main, uh, uh, they were some of the main elements who benefited from this particular aid. And I followed a person, again, like Kamal, his name is Abu Jandal. Abu Jandal, the second chapter, the third chapter, focuses on the second generation. And the reason, let me say uh, just a, a, a point about why I focus on the generations. I focus on the generation not only to show the diversity and the complexity and the nuances and the complexities among the three generations, but also to compare and contrast their rhetoric and actions. Because the question is, the question for us, not only as citizens, but as analysts to understand, <coughs> do they all think alike? Are they all determined to attack the United States of America? Uh, can we lump all militants or jihadists uh, in one camp? Or is there more to jihadism than the Al-Qaeda uh, generation? Anyway, Abu Jandal was one of the most senior lieutenants, and he was one of the most senior lieutenants for uh, Osama bin Laden. He spent uh, up to 2000. He was one of the closest persons to Osama bin Laden. In fact, he spent about 18 hours a day with Osama bin Laden. He performed some of the most sensitive mission uh, to Osama bin Laden. Personally, he was sent to Yemen in 2000 and he was implicated in the bombing against the American U.S. Uh, call, as you remember. He spent a few years in Yemen in a Yemeni prison, and now he lives freely in uh, Sana'a, Sana'a being the capital of Yemen. He has, been given, uh, he, he has given many interviews about the reasons for joining Al-Qaeda, the second generation, and about how Al-Qaeda emerged uh, in Afghanistan between 1990 uh, and 1996. Why did, second, why did the second generation turn its guns against the far enemy, the United States and Israel? Again, and I'm simplifying a great deal, three major reasons explain why the Al-Qaeda generation decided to target the United States of America. The first is basically the Afghan war emboldened and empowered this uh, second generation. I mean, just read and listen to the rhetoric by the second generation. We defeated the greatest military power in the world, the Soviet Union. Of course, we could take on the United States of America. Amer America is a, was, was and is a paper, a paper tiger. Americans don't have the nerves to fight a prolonged war like the Soviet Union. Uh, in fact, Osama bin Laden subscribed to the idea that uh, two, three attacks and the Americans would be going home. This was really, and you might say why, because, I mean, the Afghan war itself really created a new generation, emboldened a new generation of uh, um, Arab and Muslim militants who believed, as one Yemeni told me, the sky was our limits. We could do anything. We are willing to die. We love death as much as Americans and Westerners uh, uh, love life. So this was, I mean, the role of the Afghan war was really pivotal in the story of the rise and the emergence of the Al-Qaeda generation. And we, the United States of America, played a critical part in the indirect part, you might say, in the emergence of this generation. The second uh, most important reason why the second generation targeted the United States of America, as I suggested earlier, by the mid-1990s, the first generation was defeated on the battlefield. While the majority of jihadists declared a unilateral ceasefire, a tiny minority decided to expand jihad and basically shift the focus from the near enemy, Arab and Muslim governments, into the far enemy, the United States and its allies. And as I suggested earlier, Ayman Zawahiri, who is part, who was part of Kamal's generation, decided to really take the war to American shores. And finally, I would say, out of the three reasons, one of the most important reasons why the second generation uh, shifted, uh, shifted gears and decided to target the United States of America was America's military intervention in the Gulf War in 1990-1991 
and its decision to station troops permanently in Saudi Arabia. This particular decision to station troops in Saudi Arabia was very pivotal. Was very pit I don't need to tell you that Saudi Arabia is the birthplace of the Prophet Muhammad. Saudi Arabia is uh, where Mecca and Medina, the two holiest uh, Islamic shrines, uh, Saudi Arabia resonates deeply in the imagination of Arabs and Muslims. To Osama bin Laden, by deploying troops permanently in, in Saudi Arabia, the United States became the enemy of all Arabs and Muslims. And he left Saudi Arabia in 1991. He went to Pakistan, then to Sudan, and back to Afghanistan in 1996. Osama bin Laden declare, declared a holy war against not only the American government, but also against all uh, uh, American civilians, because he believed that American citizens are to blame for the foreign policy of their governments. In fact, what Osama bin Laden did, he turned the American notion, the American democracy on its head. He said, Americans elect their governments. Americans pay taxes. Americans support their government. Thus, Americans are guilty. Uh, they're, they're guilty, they're accountable for the policies that are conducted by their governments. Anyway, here we come to 9-11. And again, please remember, I'm simplifying and, and this, uh, a great deal here. Again, the conventional wisdom in the United States, as you know, after 9-11, is that uh, not, only, not only all militants and jihadists had a hand in 9-11, but in fact, as you know, the question after 9-11, where are Arab and Muslim moderates? That somehow 9-11 was a great, a great opportunity for Al-Qaeda. In fact, the evidence I show in the book, and this is really, again, I, 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 I interview hundreds of militants and mainstream, 9-11 was a disaster for Al-Qaeda. 9-11 was seen as a major negative event that would affect not only the future of the Islamist movement, but also the Ummah itself, the Ummah being the Muslim community. Almost 20 books have been written by militants since 9-11, by militant jihadists of the first generation, remember, Kamal generations. Hundreds of articles, and the argument was, how could jihadists take on the greatest military power in the world if jihadists could not take on the near enemy? How could we attack the United States of America if we fail to topple, I mean, the Egyptian and the Algerian, Algerian uh, regimes? The argument was 9-11 endangered the very survival of the Islamist movement and the uh, 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 interest of the uh, Islamic Ummah. And I, I, I would go further, that by the end of 2002, Al-Qaeda was not only militarily crippled as a result of the international coalition that the United States was able to construct after 9-11, but Al-Qaeda was internally encircled. The, the voices I show in the book, uh, I mean, uh, indicate clearly there was no major support for Al-Qaeda after 9-11. In fact, Osama bin Laden expected a flood of Arab and Muslim men to Afghanistan to fight the head of the snake, the United States. There was a trickle of Arab and Muslim men into Afghanistan, truly. I mean, the beast could have been slain very easily, not only militarily, but if, if I mean, my reading is correct, if Al-Qaeda was internally encircled by the end of 2002, some policy implications, some policy options I mean, emerge out of this particular analysis. Uh, of course, this was up till 2000, the end of 2002, the beginning of 2003, and we know what happened, the whole debate about Iraq. And of course, Al-Qaeda was in a coma by the end of 2002. Uh, here you have the Iraq war. Uh, what, what, did the, what has the Iraq war done for Al-Qaeda and for American foreign policy? And this brings us to the third generation. That is the first generation of the 1970s, 80s, and 90s. There is the second generation, the Al-Qaeda generation of the late 1990s up to the present. And now what we have is a third generation, uh, the so-called the Iraq generation. Why? Why do we have a third generation? What the American, and please remember, this is not about to argue the merits of 
whether we, ha we should have gone to Iraq or not truly. Um, this is behind us now. Um, no, no, I, I really mean it, and we'll talk about Iraq a bit. This is really, um, I mean, this particular book, I don't engage in foreign policy. I really stayed away from foreign policy because I w really wanted, this is an empirical, of course, I, I have my biases, I have my own prejudices, and my own uh, political convictions, that's not the question. But this is really, I tried as, as hard as I can to present as many voices as I can, voices, uh, militants and Islamists and jihadists, in order to understand basically the substance and the complexity of this particular universe. What the American-led invasion and occupation of Iraq uh, did was basically uh, appears to have done is to revive Al-Qaeda. Basically, why? Why did the American-led invasion revive Al-Qaeda? Because the American-led invasion of Iraq has supplied Al-Qaeda with ammunition, ideological ammunition, to use against the far enemy, the United States. Now, all we hear from Osama bin Laden, Ayman Zawahiri, look at what the Americans are doing in Iraq. America lashed out angrily, not only against Al-Qaeda, but against a Muslim country that had nothing to do with 9-11 that had committed no aggression against the United States. The American-led invasion occupation of Iraq has basically also supplied Al-Qaeda with new recruits, new, I mean, I, for a person like me who work on Arab and Muslim politics, I travel really on monthly basis to the area. I go to small villages and towns in Lebanon, in Syria, in Egypt, in, in, in Yemen, in Jordan. You have teenagers, 14 years old, who are basically trying to raise 10, 15, 20, 100 dollars to basically take a bus ride to the Syrian-Iraqi border to join the insurgency against the American forces in Iraq. This is generation, teenagers, had had nothing to do with either Islamism or jihadism. They're basically, and this brings me to the bigger point, the question is not whether uh, our actions in Iraq radicalized the militants. The militants are radicalized. The American-led invasion of Iraq has radicalized mainstream, mainstream Muslim public opinion as opposed to the tiny minorities of militants and radicals. You might say, why? And I know some of us believe, and do I believe that President Bush, when he says that he went to Iraq to basically get rid of Saddam Hussein and bring democracy to Iraq? Yes, probably he means well. I mean, I, 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 I'm not gonna quest, question his intention. That's not the question. Uh, but this particular narrative, the American narrative that we went into Iraq to democratize Iraq, to create uh, a, a nation, a democratic nation out of the ashes of, 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 of dictatorship, is not being bought in the region. Uh, is not being bought in the region not only by radicals and militants, by mainstream public opinion. The, the dominant narrative in that particular part of the world is that this is a, an imperial project. America went into Iraq to occupy an Arab and Muslim country, to humiliate Arabs and Muslims, to have permanent military bases in the country, and to basically uh, manipulate and exploit their resources. This is how it's seen in, in the region. Everything that we have seen, all the studies that we have seen is that, and this tells you about the extent of damage that the American-led invasion and occupation of Iraq has done in the fight against Al-Qaeda. Because remember, the arguments, I mean, the, the, the arguments that this, these voices make is that by the end of 2002, Al-Qaeda was internally encircled. If Al-Qaeda could not speak for militants, for the bulk of jihadists, how could Al-Qaeda speak for the Ummah, the Muslim community? And what our actions have done since 2003 is to basic, basically uh, supply Al-Qaeda with ammunition and with new recruits and to uh, radicalize and, and uh, public opinion in that part of the world. But please don't misunderstand me. I am not suggesting in any way that somehow the American-led invasion and occupation of Iraq is to blame for everything. I think this would be a great mistake and this would be a great distortion of what's happening in the region. I think there is much more to the new militancy that we are witnessing in that part of the world that, than American uh, uh, actions in Iraq uh, and elsewhere. Um, again, what I see happening, and this is, I talked about the third generation, the Iraq generation, and the Iraq generation, uh, there are certain elements that we need to understand about 
the importance of this generation. I, one of the, the, the students of the Middle East, I see uh, that militancy is migrating to the poor, disfranchised community uh, in the Muslim Middle East and tiny uh, enclaves of Muslims living in uh, European uh, countries. Uh, yes, Iraq is a radicalizing force in that part of the world. But what I also see, in addition to the American military presence in Iraq, I see a great deal of restiveness. I see a great deal of turmoil, particularly among uh, uh, poor uh, young Arab and Muslims who are burdened by political oppression and socioeconomic oppressions as well. Let me, let me just uh, you know, talk a bit about why I think this particular phenomenon is what I call the twin oppression of uh, politics and socioeconomic. Uh, I mean, here you have Egypt. Egypt uh, is the largest Arab states, it has about 72 million uh, people. 48% of Egyptians live in poverty. 48% of the 72 million Egyptians uh, live uh, on less than $2 a day. Uh, again, almost 48% of Yemenis, Yemen has about 20 million people, live below poverty. Even Lebanon, one of the most open societies in the Middle East, basically you have about 38% of the Lebanese who live, uh, who live in poverty. 51% of Sudanese uh, live uh, in poverty. You have about 80 million 80 million young Arab and Muslims who live below uh, the poverty line. And if you combine this particular, I mean, 80 million Arabs, the highest unemployment rate in the world is in the Arab and Muslim world, the highest. And in particular among young Muslims, young Muslims, uh, the highest population birth rate is in the Arab world and the Muslim world, the highest population. So you combine the highest unemployment rate and the highest population, the growth rate, was the fact, was the fact, 65% of the Muslim population of the 1.2 billion Muslims are under the ages, below the ages of 25 years old. I mean, this, the numbers are staggering. You have the highest, uh, I mean, unemployment rate, the highest uh, birth rates uh, among the, and also you have 65% of the Muslim population who are below 25 years. Uh, and this is what I see now. I mean, I, yes, Al-Qaeda is dangerous. Al-Qaeda is lethal. Uh, Al-Qaeda is still plotting to attack America and Americans. But what we are witnessing now, and what I see happening, the migration of militancy, of this type of militancy, into what I call the poverty belts in the Arab world. I mean, you have cities like Cairo, where you have six, seven million uh, poor uh, people living in the poverty lines, uh, suffocating cities like Cairo and, and Sana'a um, and, and all over the Arab world. Uh, I mean, you have Palestinian refugee camps now. We, we, we have evidence emerging that uh, Palestinian refugee camps in Lebanon and Syria and Jordan and Gaza, uh, you have Al-Qaeda is trying to create bases in these camps because of the extent of socioeconomic uh, uh, disintegration in these uh, societies. And what you also have is that the state itself can no longer deliver the goods uh, in these societies. Uh, neither the Egyptian government, nor the Yemeni government, neither the Sudanese government. While the government cannot really perform its social functions, the oppressive status, the oppressive state itself really is everywhere. Uh, I mean, I don't need to tell you about the fact that the, the conditions under which uh, Muslim populations live. Uh, I mean, you, you, I talked about the twin oppression uh, of politics and socioeconomic. And here you have now militancy migrating into these communities. Why this is an important point? Uh, I mean, just again, and I am simplifying a great deal, at the height, at the height of its military power, Al-Qaeda did not number more than 10,000 fighters. I mean, according to American intelligence, again, European intelligence, according to our own estimates of Al-Qaeda, even though 40,000 uh, young Muslim men trained in Al-Qaeda camps in Afghanistan, uh, I mean, on, on the whole, we estimate that Al-Qaeda at the height of its power did not have more than 10,000 fighters. And this particular elitism, the point I'm trying to suggest, even the first and the second generation, the jihadist movement is an elitist movement. 
uh, led and dominated by middle and upper middle class graduates, whether it's Ayman Zawahiri or Osama bin Laden or Kamal Habib, they are really, I mean, uh, the cream of their societies. They come from middle class and upper middle class and uh, uh, wealthy families. They are the uh, royalty uh, of their societies. What's happening, what appears to be happening now, is that militancy is migrating to young Muslims and young Arabs as opposed to the elite. And why the reason why the jihadist movement has failed to create a social constituency, because it was inability, it was unable to create a viable social constituency to become really a mass-based movement. And what I see happening now in the Middle East is that if, if and when militancy, if when this particular tendency materializes, if militancy really consolidate itself in these poverty belts in the Arab and Muslim world, you can imagine now a new militant movement becoming more of a mass-based movement as opposed to the elitist movements of the first and the second generation. You, you see where, 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 where the danger lies. And if this particular trend materializes, because you have really social and economic turmoil taking place in most Arab and Muslim societies, you have no democracies, you have a war in Iraq raging, which serves as a radicalizing force. So you have the convergence of foreign intervention, foreign occupation of a Muslim country. You have social and economic disintegration in many uh, parts of that particular, and you have political oppression. You have government uh, that are undemocratic. You can imagine what I call the uh, implications to internal security, regional security, and global security as well. So even though even though in the United States since 9-11 we have been very much obsessed and legitimately so with Al-Qaeda threat, I think we might be missing the big picture. And the big picture is the emergence of a mass-based militant movement driven by socioeconomic factors as opposed to doctrinal and moral issues of the first generation and the second generations. I want to stop here because I know I, I put so, I hope, so many ideas on the table and we can begin to deconstruct some of the ideas and, and I, will, I will do my best to try to answer any questions you have. Sir, I was, <clears throat> I, was I was interested in your passing reference to the Afghan war and the fact that here the greatest superpower, or seemingly the greatest superpower, was being defeated. And I'm interested in the impact on al-Qaeda at that point. The American perception was a little different. Uh, at that time, um, the Carter administration, uh, Brzezinski was riding high. And Brzezinski's motto was there was an arc of crisis, which of course included the southern regions of the USSR. And that uh, one of his famous remarks was that uh, nationalism is the Achilles heel of the USSR. At the same time, the US wound up training uh, the Taliban, training al-Qaeda, arming them and they looked at this as a great victory. Well, what did they conclude about the United States after the Afghan war, as a result of the Afghan war? I mean, thank you for your question. Al-Qaeda, uh, just a point of clarification, Al-Qaeda was not born till the mid-1990s. There was no Al-Qaeda in the 1980s or even in the early 1990s. Uh, in fact, Al-Qaeda was born as a direct result as I suggested earlier, of the American intervention in the Gulf War in 1991 and the permanent stationing troops in Saudi Arabia. This is when Osama bin Laden decided to basically uh, uh, target the far enemy, uh, the United States. Uh, and really what's fascinating, and now we seem, I mean, as you know, we always impose the present on history. We read history in terms of the moment. Uh, I've written a book on this, on America's relations with Islamists. It's America, and it's called America and Political Islam, Clash of Cultures or Clash of Interest. And I don't think I was surprised by the indirect alliance between the United States and the jihadists or the mujahideen, the Afghan mujahideen in Afghanistan. Between 1947, between 1947 and 1990, the United States basically used the Islamists, used Islamists 
and other religiously oriented forces against socialist, against Arab nationalist, against communist. So between 1947 and 1990, the United States basically was, again, in the same camp as Islamist and religiously oriented uh, elements, because as you know, everything was really seen through the lens of the Soviet, I mean, the, the Cold War with the Soviet Union. And uh, of course, American policymakers did not really take into account the implications, the broader implications. Um, and in many ways, by the way, uh, one of the reasons that explains uh, the anti-American sentiments in that part of the world, because I think the United States is seen in the eyes of many Arabs and Muslims as the power that sustained and maintained the oppressive political order in that part of the world. I mean, look at the allies of the United States in that part of the world. I mean, our allies, uh, Pakistan, uh, Saudi Arabia, um, uh, Gulf states, um, Algeria, uh, Morocco, uh, and we try to nourish conservative Islamic state as a counterweight, as a uh, balancing act against the radical socialist and communist element in that part of the world. And I think uh, in many ways, uh, uh, I mean, 9-11 was an indirect product, an indirect result of the alliances that the United States built with those elements, the Islamists and the religious forces in the region between 1947 and 1990. Hi, what a <laughs> what a wonderful uh, talk you've given, and a book I'm eager to read it. Uh, my question pertained to this gentleman's. I'd read the book recently, uh, Devil's Game, where the courting of the Islamists that you mentioned in '47. My first question was, how much uh, influence do you think we really had our courting and assistance of the Muslim Brotherhood, or would it have been inevitable uh, their continuing formation? Uh, so in other words, he, in the devil's game, he suggested that we played a prominent role in their organization a against Iran, certainly our CIA helped. I'm just curious, how, how much do you feel the U.S. helped? Secondly, my, my question was, uh, he suggests that we should back off, you know, we shouldn't have gone into Iraq uh, for the reasons you mentioned for that third generation. What do you think the United States and the West should do now to uh, try to put the genie back in the bottle. Will it take more than a generation? I mean, can we uh, support moderate elements, or are there moderate elements to be supported? And in that book, he, the man mentioned where um, the students used to uh, yell, democracy now, uh, then we, with our assistance, uh, they were put down, and then they started yelling, Allah Akbar. <laughs> So I'm just curious how, how much influence the United States had, and then what do you think should be done? You know, thank you. Thanks for the questions. Uh, just a point of clarification. I think we tend to really exaggerate, I mean, even I do as an analyst, the role of the United States yeah. in the, in the uh, entire uh, regional landscape. Let me put it this way. I mean, even if you had canceled the role of the United States from the regional equation, equation you're gonna, you, you would end up with the similar conditions. Uh, I mean, you have dictators that bled their societies dry. Uh, I mean, Saddam Hussein, the United States did not create Saddam Hussein, even though the United States dealt with Saddam Hussein in the 1980s, in order to uh, counterbalance the rise of the Mullah's uh, regime in Iran. Uh, the United States did have dealings with the Muslim Brotherhood. We have, I mean, in particular, uh, American intelligence services basically provided money and, and, and uh, advice to the Muslim Brotherhood. The Muslim Brotherhood is one of the most powerful uh, religious organization in the Muslim world. And please, uh, just as a point of clarification, I'm talking here about the jihadist movement. The jihadist movement represents really a small fraction of the Islamist movement. Most of the Islamists are mainstream political activists who have renounced the use of force in the service of politics, and they have accepted the rules of the political game. The jihadist movement really represents a tiny fraction of that particular movement, and the United States did have, I don't know whether the, its role was pivotal, I would, not, I, I would say whether the United States helped the Muslim Brotherhood or not, I think the Muslim Brotherhood would have survived and, and prospered in Egypt, in Jordan, in Saudi Arabia, and other places as well. To come back to Iraq, the truth is we are facing uh, a major dilemma in Iraq today. Um, I think it's very easy to, to rehash the whole debate about Iraq. I think the longer we stay in Iraq, we know that America's military presence in Iraq fuels militancy in the region. Uh, we know now 
that you have, I mean, the American-led invasion and occupation of Iraq has basically radicalized uh, some segments of the population. Uh, we know in Jordan, in Syria, in Egypt, uh, in Lebanon, Algeria, even some Europeans, some Muslim Europeans now, are trying to really find ways to migrate to Iraq to fight the Americans. So if we stay, our very actions basically uh, fueling insurgency. But if we pack and leave, I mean, you're going to have a disaster on your hands. Surely if the United States pack and leave, I mean, Iraq would likely plunge into full sectarian strife. I don't think we have a civil war in Iraq, a full civil war in Iraq now. We have limited, limited sectarian strife. So if the United States leaves Iraq overnight, you're going to have a major collapse uh, in Iraq. You're going to have Al-Qaeda establishing one of its biggest bases uh, probably in the Muslim world. And already Ayman Zawahi is saying we have broken America's back in Iraq. You can imagine the implications on American foreign policy if the United States was to pull it out of Iraq overnight. I think uh, the point here is that the United States is really facing some, a major dilemma in the country. And I think probably a third option presents itself. And the third option I have written extensively and other, uh, I mean, uh, scholars written on this, but is for the United States to basically have an orderly uh, uh, timetable uh, for pulling out its troops from Iraq. Tells Iraqis, listen, we will be out of Iraq, from Iraq in one year and a half. This is your country. It's your future. Of course, we owe Iraq. We, we, I mean, we have a moral responsibility because, after all, we opened uh, the gates of hell in Iraq. But in one year and a half, you'll have your country. We have no designs on your country. We have no plans to have permanent bases uh, in Iraq. Uh, not only we will pull out militarily, we will deepen our investment, our, econo our investments in the socioeconomic process in the country. We are spending about $80 billion a year on the military campaign now. Let's invest 40 billion. Half of the money would go to, so while we pull out militarily, we deepen our socioeconomic investment in the country. I mean, this is just one option. Uh, I'm not suggesting at all here that this particular option could work, but at least it's out of the dichotomy that we find ourselves in Iraq. And of course, you have some, some American politicians now who are saying, well, let's divide Iraq. Let's split Iraq into three states, a Sunni Arab state, a Shiite state, and a Sunni Kurd state. And if you do so, not only you are reinforcing existing perceptions of America as an imperial power, because after all, the United States would be seen as playing empire, but in fact, you are replacing the one war that exists in Iraq with three multiple wars in the country. I mean, of course, but the fact is some of our politicians are basically talking about the, op the option of splitting up Iraq is an indication of the state of desperation in which the United States find itself in, in, in Iraq. It's really, truly a very difficult and very complex scenario. It's uh, interesting that uh, the discussion of Carter and Brzezinski was brought up because each has to take a role in present-day Iran being a uh, fundamentalist and the mess that is now there because of uh, a president of Iran who believes in reincarnation and perhaps would not hesitate to create havoc because of that. Um, the weapon of mass destruction really isn't bird flu, but the bomber. And the further problem that exists in many countries, and especially now in the Middle East, is corruption and the bomber, and especially the bomber who believes in reincarnation. And then the sectarian violence with the death squads. Uh, you've oversimplified the jihadist in that uh, Sunni is butchering, uh, Shia is butchering Sunni. And that then begets more death squads and blood violence. Um, there has to be a better solution, and that is what has been proposed, and that is uh, having an honest uh, Iraqi military, an honest Iraqi police, be able to stand up, and then the U.S. can stand down. Much of the U.S. deaths have been uh, through the bombings and or by stupidities. Uh, what's the question? The question really is, what would, what would happen to you if you spoke freely in Iraq at the present time without a bodyguard? That's exactly what I'm trying to say, is that you have a situation now, total chaos in the country. You have a situation whereby American soldiers 
every time they venture out of their military fortresses, basically are being attacked on a daily basis. The average attacks are between 180 attacks uh, a day, uh, a month, uh, a day, I'm sorry, uh, on a daily basis. The average attacks against American forces. Yet the good uh, the things. Jihad, the jihadists are killing not only coalition forces, they're killing also Muslims in large numbers. Because I think what you have, Al-Qaeda is trying to really instigate a sectarian war in the country. Because uh, to them, the only way for Al-Qaeda to win the war is to basically create a, a more chaotic situation in the country. Yet the good things can't be talked about because they then become targets for the bombers. And that's the dynamic that's made everything worse. Uh, let me, let me, I mean, I, I think you're raising really critical points about what's happening in Iraq, about the debate in Iraq, because I, I think we can, we can, uh, I mean, is it civil war? Is it limited civil war? Is it full sectarian strife? Has political progress been achieved in Iraq? Uh, what's, how is the situation in Iraq? Let me say a few things, uh, empirical really, uh, because I, I mean, are we delighted to have Saddam Hussein out of the picture? Absolutely. Is there anyone here who would say that Iraq is not better because Saddam Hussein is out of the picture? We, we agree on that. Well, he was called the butcher of Baghdad, we, not we, because we, he yeah. had a kebab palace. Yeah, yeah. No, 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 but I'm saying you're right. We, we agree on that. I mean, you, you're absolutely correct. But let's see what's happening in Iraq today. Iraqis are deeply divided. I mean, Sunnis and Shiites, Sunni Arabs and Sunni Kurds and Shiites are deeply divided over the future direction of their country. Even though, even though some politicians are trying very hard to really resolve their differences, the sectarian divide between the Shiites, who represents about 60% of the population, and Sunni Arab has become hardened, wider and deeper. You, you've heard about the killings on daily basis. I mean, the sectarian killings have increased, multiplied. I mean, on average, in, in, during the months of May, almost 900 civilians, Iraqis, uh, were killed as a result of the sectarian divide. In fact. According to American military commanders, the sectarian divide now is much more lethal than the insurgency itself. And this tells you about the extent of the fault lines in Iraq itself, internal fault lines, point one. You have population flow from the mixed areas. Sunnis and Shiites are leaving their mixed communities into the safety of their own, I mean, sectarian sects and tribes. And thirdly, as I suggested, you have multiple sectarian uh, killings in Iraq. And this particular situation, by the way, is very serious. It, it, it's very, how do you deal with it? Uh, first of all, we got rid of Saddam Hussein and we lost the Sunni Arab community. Saddam Hussein was a Sunni Arab. And in the eyes of Sunni Arabs, basically, we were part of the conspiracy to basically empower the Shiites. I mean, this is how, how the Sunni uh, Arabs perceive the situation. Now, the United States, the, the U.S. military is realizing it's the Shiites death squads. We armed and trained the, the, the pro-Iranian Shiites, and now they are doing the killings of the Sunnis. And now the United States, as you suggested, is saying to the Shiites, hey, listen, what are you doing here? And the danger lies in the fact that not only the United States lost Sunni Arabs when it toppled Saddam Hussein, the United States could end up losing the Shiites as well. And the danger lies here is that the big point to really highlight and this is, not, this is, again, an empirical point. The United States, unfortunately, finds itself in the same position in which Britain and France found themselves in the 1920s and 30s. The United States, by the way, is being used by local players. Uh, I mean, the, the, the pro, uh, the, the religious uh, Shia parties in Iraq use the United States to own Iraq. And now, since they are in power, I expect them, if the pressure, if the United States exerts more pressure, on the uh, pro-Iranian Shiite parties, probably the Shiite party would say to United, well, thank you very much. We don't need you anymore. Goodbye. And it, 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 the irony is that the United States could really find itself losing both communities uh, and the civil war would likely escalate if the United States... I'll, I'll just stop with... Uh, sorry. I'll just stop with if someone helps the U.S., they get butchered. Thank you so much. Thank you for your questions, by the way. Okay. I'd like to get back to the points that you were making about uh, the third generation. And I'd like, if you could, to link that with the globalization of jihad. And in this context, you talked about recruiting 14-year-olds uh, from Syria, packing up and trying to get money to get on a bus to go to Iraq. My question is the impact that this, next, this phenomenon that we have now has going the other way. 
In other words, have we re-energized jihadism within Syria? I was in Egypt last summer when the attack on Sharm el-Sheikh occurred. Yeah. I'm, and then the second part, and this is an extrapolation, do you see a link now also in other non-Arab Muslim countries, specifically places That's like Nigeria, Indonesia, yes. and the Philippines? Great questions, really. I thank you very much. Um, again, uh, uh, please remember, I mean, the gentleman is up. We, we are speculating a great deal. Uh, this, is, this is a very, I mean, uh, these are difficult issues, and we're all trying to really make sense of a difficult situation. I think you have really raised a very critical question here about, I mean, the rise of a, a, a third generation, the so-called Iraq generation. Uh, in the book, by the way, when I charted the journey of the three generations, because the reason why I, I tried to do so is to understand what's happening within the movement themselves. And in many ways, in fact, uh, you can make the argument is that you cannot really understand 9-11 except by understanding the mutations and shifts that have taken place within the jihadist movement. In fact, I would go further to say that 9-11 cannot be understood except as part of the internal struggle that really, I mean, torn the jihadist movement apart after the movement was, I mean, lost the war in the, in the 1990s. And in fact, 9-11, the United States was not a direct target. The United States was an indirect target. Remember, the primary target of jihadism is the home, their home countries, the near enemy. So, uh, and as uh, uh, Ayman Zawahiri has argued all along, is that the only way to win the war at home is to force the United States out of the Arab and Muslim world, because once you force the United States out of the Muslim world, jihadists could easily take on the pro-Western secular governments. What's happening with the third generation, and this is the reason why this is, I, I, I'm glad because I should have said it, is that now, while the first generation targeted the near enemy and the second generation targeted the far enemy, the third generation now has declared an all-out war against both the near enemy and the far enemy. I mean, look truly, by the way, what has been happening since uh, the last two years, May uh, 2003, attacks, Saudi Arabia, in Indonesia, in Turkey, in Yemen, in Spain, in London, in Jordan, in Egypt. I mean, this generation now, and of course the, the bombings in Jordan and the wedding, uh, now the third generation is waging an all-out war against, I mean, the world. And again, it tells you about the extent of mutations that are taking place within the movement uh, as a result, as a result of America's all-out war in Iraq, because, I mean, partly so. Because, I mean, every generation will have different uh, targets, different mentality, different mindset. And I went back and I interviewed some of the leaders of the first generation. And even some of the leaders of some of the militants, uh, the jihadists, are really terrified by the brutality of the third generation. I mean, I, I really, I hope, and I, I, mean, I want to uh, plug a, a point for my book. Uh, I really, no, no, truly. I really would like you to read, in particular, I mean, I, I chart the journey of the third generation. Even jihadists of the first generations are terrified by the brutality and, I mean, this, I mean, the third generation is basically trying to kill hundreds of Muslims in order to get one coalition forces, one American. And this tells you about really the, the gravity of the crisis and how the war, the raging war in Iraq has really militarized even an already radical generation. Uh, and I think what we need to really think about, as you suggest, is that not only the attacks on the United States, but how, when the third generation goes back home. I mean, already Middle Eastern governments are trying to see when the third generation go back to Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Egypt, Syria, what kind of implications to internal security and regional and international uh, security as well. Um, you started out by talking about the jihadist movement being a social movement and moral and uh, trying to create Allah's kingdom on earth. And you talked about the first generation being defeated on the battlefield. And I wondered, with this being a moral and social movement, how did it become militaristic? What, was it militaristic from the beginning? What is the intention behind militarism? And then quickly a question too about Iraq. And um, say hypothetically the United States announces its intention of leaving. What do you think needs to happen to end the conflict, the fighting in Iraq? I mean, I think 
uh, again, uh, a point of qualification. Uh, I don't think you can talk about good jihadists and bad jihadists. Uh, I, I hope I did not in any way try to give you the impression there are good jihadists out there. Uh, please, uh, that's not really the point I'm trying to make. Uh, I could not find a single militant or jihadist who had anything positive to say about other America or American foreign policy or Americans. Uh, this is not the question. The question for me on the table was, do all jihadists, did all jihadists uh, targeted the United States, even though the overwhelming majority of jihadists have really nothing to say positive about America, a tiny fraction of jihadists targeted the United States, and that's the second generation. So in this particular sense, really, from the birth of the movement in the mid-1970s, this was an underground fringe movement, that the movement itself, even the first generation, they believed in the use of violence and terrorism in order to topple the secular order and replace it with authentic Islamic states. Violence and force really all means, I mean, what, what's the definition of a jihadist? A definition of jihadist is a religious activist who believes in the use of all means, including violence and terrorism, in the service of religion and politics. Uh, even Kamal generation, I mean, Kamal spent 11 years in prison. He was sentenced to life in prison, tortured brutally. Even Kam I could not get Kamal to say that the use of force is not legitimate in the service of politics, even now. Despite everything, I mean, he's, he has really been undergoing a major, you might say, soul searching after he was released from prison. So the fact is, I mean, deep down, this particular movement is socialized into the question that what exists is decadent, the system. Uh, this system is not legitimate. It's illegitimate. Uh, it is forced on Muslims. The only way for Muslims to live a full life, according to jihadists, is to basically create an authentic order based on the so-called the Sharia or Islamic law. Uh, and that's what I meant by moralism. I didn't say it's a moral movement. I said, I said it was driven by doctrinal and moral concerns. And it's not moral. It's amoral, absolutely. Uh, the question of Iraq, I mean, uh, again, to come back to the gentleman, uh, I'm, I'm glad we have, we, we must have dissidents, otherwise we'll be, I mean, we, uh, you're, you're, you're really forcing us to think the issues because, I mean, we all could be wrong. I mean, I, I uh, and we, I have, I mean, I was one of those analysts who underestimated the strengths of Al-Qaeda in the late 1990s because we basically equated Efficacy was numbers. Al-Qaeda did not number more than 10,000 fighters. We said, well, look, Al-Qaeda was not really important because Kamal's generation uh, numbered 100,000 fighters in the late 1990s. We made the mistake by equating efficacy with numbers, and that was wrong, and we could be wrong again. Uh, we don't know how the situation, uh, I mean, do I believe in the short term that Iraq will likely witness violence for the next five or six years, absolutely. I have no doubts about it, that you're going to have more bloodshed, uh, both Iraqis, I mean, mainly Iraqis are being killed. Uh, of course, the United States has lost uh, 2,000 and almost 2,500 soldiers, and it's horrific, whether it's one soldier, uh, 25,000 injured. But you have, I would argue, based on all the numbers that I have seen, m over 100,000 Iraqis have died, civilians. Uh, and this is not just my estimate, this is the estimate uh, conducted by John Hopkins University Medical School. And it says a year ago that uh, over, I mean, almost 100,000 Iraqi civilians died. And it was a conservative estimate based on, I think the truth is, few Iraqis believe that the United States is planning to leave Iraq. I mean, I think if you ask any Iraqis, Iraqis believe the United States is there to stay. The United States is ex manipulating, exploiting their resources. The United States is planning to have uh, military bases, permanent military bases. And this is why it's essential for the Bush administration to tell, to convince, to tell us, are we planning to have, do you, does anyone know, does any one of us know here, that the United States is not planning to have military bases in Iraq? I don't know. We have differing signals from the administrations. Iraqis believe, I mean, everyone I talk to, yes, the United States is planning to stay there. This is why it's essential that the Bush administration says, we are not having a timetable because we lost the war. We would like you to know that we have no designs on Iraq. It's your country. It's your future. We're going to give you a year. And not only we're going to pull out militarily, but we're going to deepen our investment in the social and economic uh, uh, sectors in Iraq. And this might, could, may, 
basically represent a turning point, truly, because we don't know. I mean, the, the fault lines in Iraq are so deep and so hardened now, it's so difficult for us to see a light at the end of the tunnel. Do I believe in 15 years that Iraq could be a better place? Yes, I do believe it. But in the meantime, I mean, it's easy for you and I to say, well, look, give Iraq is a break. In 15 years, there might be a fun functioning democracy. If you were an Iraqi living in Iraq under such brutal conditions, surely you would say 15 years is a lifetime. A lifetime. Please. OK, thank you very much. Um, I'm also a social scientist, so I appreciate the approach. And I think um, you know, before the war, you know, my colleagues and I, of course, we predicted everything that's going to happen. And a lot of it is, is very predictable. Um, and it's what you say is a good illustration of the law of opposites, um, you know, how you create the opposite of what, at least we, what we say we're doing. Um, so my, my question is, um, it's obvious that our, like, U.S. policies now, like towards Iran, like even like the incentives and disincentive, which is rewards and punishment or punishing um, Palestinians for um, choosing Hamas. I mean, I think we should call HR for 681, the, instead of the Palestinian Anti-Terrorism Act, the Palestinian Terrorism Recruitment Act, because that's more accurate. Of, that, that things will have the opposite effect and will continue to escalate. So, um, and I think also social scientists have relevant bodies of knowledge which are completely absent in the think tanks and Congress and the media. So I'm wondering if you are, um, you know, talking to people or applying this to, to policy. I mean, it's obvious that what we're doing is going to be provocative and escalate. And do you? Well, you know, uh, the beauty is that it's really wonderful to be a critic. We can bark and get away with it. I mean, <laughs> I can go home and I, you know, I, I'm not a policymaker. It's so easy to be a critic. I mean, uh, can you imagine? Well, I, don't, I don't mean. I mean, no, I yeah. know, but I'm saying it, it's really just a point of uh, just a qualification that. Uh, I, I think the administration is facing some very serious choices, very serious options. I mean, and some of it, it's its own making, because I think uh, after 9-11, the administration decided on a particular strategy, an all-out war uh, against an imagined enemy. I mean, you have Al-Qaeda. No one is suggesting that the United States should not really hammer away at the beast. I mean, no, even, even Muslim clerics, by the way, when the United States declared war on Afghanistan, even though they, they, they found American action, it was they, they wanted the United States to really use legal means to really uh, take Osama bin Laden uh, to courts. But they did not call for jihad against the United States. Many Muslims, by the way, understood that the United States had to respond to 9-11. To it was later on when the United States basically decided to declare an all-out war, an out against terror, the so-called the war, uh, uh, I mean, against on terror. I mean, it is. Uh, the, not to mention, I mean, Iraq, I mean, many people, I mean, some of us, uh, we, we, I mean, you have a secular fundamentalist like uh, Saddam Hussein and a religious fundamentalist like Osama bin Laden. I didn't have to be an expert on, on the Middle East to realize, I mean, the cleavages, uh, the conceptual and, and, and ideological differences uh, between the two uh, political uh, ideologies. On the one hand, on the one hand, uh, the president says that he is engaged, he has a mission. He has a mission to promote democracy in that part of the world. Iraq was part of that particular mission, to democratize the region, to plant Jeffersonian democracy in the, in the heart of the Arabian desert. I mean, no, no, just stay with me for a second, please, because I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm going to just give him, I mean, the benefit of the doubt. Fine. I mean, here you have, I mean, on the one hand, you have elections in Palestinian territories. The people elect Hamas because the people realized that Mahmoud Abbas, the Palestinian president, could not deliver the goods, either the socioeconomic goods or even the peace goods. The Palestinian Fatah, the uh, ruling uh, Palestinian uh, I mean, party of the Palestinian Authority, basically is highly corrupt. They elected Hamas not because they, they don't really believe in the peace process, because they realized the president, the Palestinian president, did not deliver the goods. What have we done since the elections of Hamas? Our strategy, along with you know, our European friends and Israel, is to starve the Palestinians and force Hamas really down. And you know, I don't need to tell you that Palestinian society appears to be coming apart now. I mean, you have almost starvation in Gaza. Uh, you have, I mean, the civil war starting between, I mean, Hamas uh, uh, and uh, Fatah, Fatah being the ruling party of the Palestinian Authority. Here you have the Egyptian government 
postponing local elections for two years. We did not say a word about the... You have judges in Egypt who are basically physically abused. The judges in Egypt are revolting. We did not say a word about the, uh, I mean, abuse of the judges. And this, and the question, because you see, many of you sometimes don't realize why Muslims don't realize that we have good intentions. I mean, when Muslims see, on the one hand, our actions in Iraq, on the other hand, they say, well, look, if you are really serious about democracy, why not say a word to your pro-Egyptian, I mean, the, 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 the Mubarak government? Why not say a word to the Jordanian government? Why not try to help the Palestinian society stand up on its feet? And this gap between rhetoric and reality in the United States, I mean, in, in our policy and our, uh, I mean, pronouncements, sends the wrong signals. Not to mention the fact that Al Jazeera, Al Arabiya, the, the network, the Arab television networks, show on daily basis the imagery, the imagery of Abu Ghraib prisons, the imagery of Haditha, I mean, Haditha is the, and those images um, have become carved in stone in the imagination of Arabs and Muslims, and, and, they, and that's the point I was trying to make. They supply ideological ammunition to Al Qaeda, and they supply, I mean, ammunition to a new generation of recruits in the region. Thank you. Yeah. Professor Fawaz Azerjes teaches international affairs and Middle Eastern studies at Sarah Lawrence College in Bronxville, New York. For more information, visit journeyofthejihadist.com.